This is love that has pursued you, even to the point of taking on frail human flesh and submitting to a criminal's death. This is love that took nails. This is love that wore a crown of thorns. This is sacrificial love. This is supreme love. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller. Today we're going to continue a message we began last time, Knowing the Love of Christ. And Jonathan, we see the ultimate demonstration of the love of God for us in that God sent His Son Jesus to go to the cross for us. But why was His death being nailed to the cross, the spilling of His blood, why was that such a significant demonstration of His love? Well, it is the supreme demonstration of his love. And, and it's interesting here in, in this passage of Ephesians that we're going to look at together in a moment. Uh, Paul describes this love of Jesus as being a love that surpasses knowledge. And I think he means there that it's something that it's a stretch for our minds even to comprehend. Uh, this love that is willing to die even for enemies, even for sinners like us. And at the cross, we see Jesus love us in a way that no one has ever loved anyone else before or since. You know, we sometimes may think of, well, I could easily lay down my life for someone I love deeply, a spouse, a child, something like that. Maybe a little bit more difficult to lay your life down for a stranger. But here, Christ, he laid down his life for enemies. It really is mind-blowing, isn't it? It is mind-blowing, and I think as we begin to take hold of this love and begin to understand something of it, it is a love that has the power to, by the Spirit of God, transform our lives. Hmm. And, I, and I, I hope those who are listening will be able to experience something of that. Well, we're going to continue to look at this today from the book of Ephesians. We are in chapter 3, verses 14 to 21, as we continue the message, Knowing the Love of Christ. Here is Jonathan come to Jesus and you open up your life to him. You trust him as your savior and your Lord. And you do that in good faith. It's genuine. Your conversion is a true conversion. But perhaps as you look back over the months and years of the Christian life, you realize that you've actually been feeling your way with Jesus in this relationship. You know that he calls you to obey his word and to trust that he is right in everything that he says. But you haven't been quite ready to do all that you know he calls you to do. You haven't been ready to set aside certain patterns of life, certain sins, even if you're honest. You know that he calls you to trust him for the future, but you've been holding firmly to anxiety, Anxiety about who to marry, whether to marry. Anxiety about finances. Anxiety for your children, for their education, for their future. You know that he calls you to place your life, your dreams, your ambitions, your desires, your resources, your future, all that you are, all that you have into his hands. He calls you to trust him entirely. He calls you to have faith in him in every respect. Now, I won't ask now for a show of hands for those who are doing that 100% entirely and without reserve today. I doubt that any hands could actually go up. If any did go up, I'd love to hear the spiritual secret of the person who's raising their hand. But none of us can claim that we're there, can we? We may have faith in Jesus, saving faith. We may belong to him, but we need to be growing in faith, don't we? that Jesus could more and more make our heart his home, that Jesus might by his Spirit truly dwell within us, in me and in you, in that fullest sense, that more and more of my life might be taken up by Jesus and reshaped by Jesus. And if that's going to happen, I need to have faith in him. I need to have growing faith in him. And if I'm going to have faith, if I'm going to trust where I find it hard to trust, God is going to have to strengthen me by his spirit and out of his glorious riches. And so Paul prays that the Lord would do that very thing. He prays for faith that Christ might dwell within. Next, he prays for understanding that we might know Christ's love. Middle of verse 17. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and high and deep 
is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. I don't think it's an oversimplification to say that all relational problems we experience stem from a lack of love or from a lack of trust in that love. I mean, if you truly love me, and I know and understand and believe that you truly love me, it's more or less impossible for me to have a real problem with you. Of course, I might be unreasonable and in my sinfulness pick a fight, but basically if those things are in place, it's hard to be in conflict or discord. If as a spouse, your husband or wife truly loves you, and you know and understand and believe that they truly love you, then you should be okay in the long run. It should be possible to work things through. If as a child, your parent loves you, and you know and you believe and you understand that they love you, it's hard to resent that parent or feel angry or bitter toward them. The scriptures make it crystal clear to us that our God is the God of love. His love is perfect. His love is pure. His love is whole. There is never a problem that flows from God's failure to love, to love rightly, to love well. But you and I do have a struggle in our heart and in our mind to know and believe and understand the love of God. We get into all kinds of difficulty, don't we? Because we don't have a good handle on the love of God. When he calls us to obedience, we struggle in our heart of hearts to believe that his instruction to us in his word is given out of love. We tend to imagine in our sinfulness that he is withholding something good from us when he calls us to live in certain ways, when he calls us to do things that we'd rather not do, when he calls us to avoid things that we'd rather indulge in. That was the case in the Garden of Eden, you'll remember. Adam and Eve came to believe that the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would do them so much good, would give them so much joy and pleasure and power and all the rest, and that God was holding back something good from them in telling them not to eat of it. And we think just the same way. It's a familiar pattern of thought. We think just the same way when it comes to materialism or sexual behavior and expression, when it comes to truth-telling, when it comes to financial integrity. We somehow suspect that God is holding back something very good from us in calling us to obedience. We somewhere suspect in our heart of hearts that we would be happier and more fulfilled. We would flourish more in our lives if we went our way rather than God's way. We struggle to trust God, don't we, when suffering comes knocking at our door. You know, we believe that He loves us in the good times. Of course we do. We see evidences of his blessings, and we say, thank you, Lord, for this and that and the, and the other. We believe that he loves us when health is good, when family relationships are cohesive, when finances are okay. But when we fall ill, when tragedy strikes, when we lose a loved one, when the job disappears, when the money is tight, when we experience suffering or look on suffering in the world around us, I saw in the New York Times just this week, there was a, there was a picture of a malnourished child in a war-torn area, and I, I looked at this picture of this child who, who subsequently died after the picture was taken, and I, I was so overwhelmed just by the sorrow of our world, and we look on these things, don't we? And we struggle to process, and it's harder, isn't it? It's harder. We find it harder to believe that God is truly loving. And so to walk in faith and obedience and godliness and joy, to know the fullness of God in our lives, we need to be in a place where we know and understand and believe in our heart of hearts that Jesus really loves us. We need to know and understand and believe in our heart of hearts that his love is perfect and good and true and pure. If we actually had that conviction settled in our hearts, and if we knew the full extent of his love, so much else would fall into place for us, wouldn't it? And so Paul prays. He gets down on his knees 
and he asks God to give his people power to grasp his love, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep his love is. And friends, you and I this morning, we need the help of the Spirit of God to understand the nature and the scope and the full extent of the love of Christ. You and I, whatever we know of His love, we have so much more to see and grasp and to understand. You see, the love of God in Christ is a kind of love that you and I have not seen or found or given or received anywhere else. And this love, well, it surpasses all human knowledge, says Paul. It's astounding love. It's costly love. It is love that borders on recklessness. It's so absurdly generous and loving and kind. It's a love that created you and me from nothing when there was no need for us even to be. It's a love that gave us a beautiful world in which to live. It's a love that gave us opportunity to know our maker, to enjoy relationship with him. But the tragedy of the human story is that having been given so much, we have turned away from our creator. We have taken his gifts, but we have spurned him as only the most ungrateful children can do. But rather than condemn us for this profound act of disrespect and disloyalty, This loving God pursued us in His grace. Rather than leave us to the destruction of His judgment, which we so richly deserve, He decided to take upon Himself the cost of our rebellion and our foolishness, bearing in the person of His Son the punishment that is rightly ours, that we might experience and enjoy His love in all eternity. And so to know and see and understand the love of God in Christ, we look back 2,000 years in history, and we see a rugged cross on a hill outside Jerusalem. As Paul says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, God demonstrates His own love for us in this, demonstrates it beyond a shadow of a doubt, demonstrates it beyond any questioning. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is love. This is love unknown. My Savior's love to me. This is the love of God that reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea. This is love divine, all loves excelling. This is love, says the Apostle Paul, that surpasses knowledge. You can't know it with your limited mind. You can't express it with your feeble words. It's bigger and higher and wider and deeper and longer than anything the human mind could ever fathom or ever comprehend. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, a message called Knowing the Love of Christ. And we'll get back to the message in just a moment. Well, if you're a regular listener to Encounter the Truth, I hope that listening has been an encouragement to you. You're learning more about what it means to walk with Christ and that God has been using this program to strengthen you in that. If so, we'd love to hear how the Lord is using this program in your life. You can give us your feedback easily. Come to our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org and click on the contact link. We'd love to uh, know how God is using this program in your life. And if we can, we'd love to pray for and encourage you as well. Again, our website address, EncounterTheTruth.org and click on the contact link. All right, back to the message. Once again, here is Jonathan. Now, such love, it transforms everything. Such love, it reshapes everything. Such love, it puts everything else in our lives into proper perspective. It puts everything into a new frame and a new context. You see, there's no problem in your life or mine today, no struggle you are working through that will not be helped and will not be transformed through knowing more fully the love of God in Christ Jesus. There's nothing. If you're not a believer, if you haven't put your trust in Jesus, here's the big thing you need to know and you need to carry with you out the door this morning, the thing you need to believe. You need to know that the God who made you is a God who loves you. Not just a little bit, 
not the kind of love that sends a valentine or gives a quick hug. This is love that has pursued you, even to the point of taking on frail human flesh and submitting to a criminal's death. This is love that took nails. This is love that wore a crown of thorns. This is costly love. This is sacrificial love. This is supreme love. Maybe love elsewhere has let you down. Maybe trust has been broken in your life. Maybe you are here this morning as a profoundly wounded person because you have been unloved in the cruelest way. And maybe you're here this morning wondering whether there is such a thing as love and whether love can truly be found. Well, please know and please believe this much. Understand the demonstration of God's love in time and space and history. Know this, Jesus loves you. His love is wider and longer and higher and deeper than any love you could ever know. If you're walking in sin at the moment, if you are doing things you know you should not be doing, if you are living in a way that you know is profoundly wrong, if your life is marked by ugly behaviors, if your mind is filled with ugly thoughts, and frankly, you are struggling even to want to give up those sins, let alone really address them. If that's where you are, I'm confident of this much for you. If you can get your head around the love of God in Christ in increasing measure, if you can grasp it in some fresh way this morning, if you do that, you will have a new impetus and motivation and strength to address that sin. If you're in the veil of suffering at the minute, if you are walking through the valley even of the shadow of death this morning, and I suspect a number are, if you are wondering how you can live through this thing, whatever this thing is, how to put one step in front of the other, I won't promise you that your problem will go away today, but I will say this, a deeper knowledge, a firmer grasp, a wider understanding of the love of God in Christ, it will enable you to walk through that thing in a way that you otherwise would not be able to do. Whatever else you can know about your experience, the love of God in Christ tells you this much it tells you that God's plans and His purposes for you in this are born of love for you. They flow from a loving heart and not from anything else. I've said it recently in this sermon series already, but it's so obvious that we are creatures who flourish, creatures who truly live as we are loved as we experience true love. It's such a deep need for us, each one of us, that need to be loved. It's woven into who we are. Children who are unloved, we've all seen it, haven't we? There's something crushed and broken about them, and the consequences of that spill out into all their lives. But children who are loved, it's written all over them, and they're set up for life. Spouses who are unloved, wives who are unloved by their husbands, we've all seen it, haven't we? That process of withering that takes place, a crushing of spirit over time and over decades so that sometimes a person somehow even becomes less of themselves. Or by contrast, a spouse who is loved and who is loved well, a spouse who flourishes and grows and becomes more of what they are. We're built to be loved. We all know that. And Paul wants us to know and to see that we are loved in a way that surpasses even our capacity to comprehend it, to wrap our minds around it. And it has to be said that our readiness to accept that love, the love of God in Christ, to trust that the love is genuine, to anticipate love rather than harm in a relationship, love rather than hatred, it is damaged and it is diminished by our experience living in this very unloving world. Sir Tim Berners-Lee is credited with the creation of the internet 30-odd years ago. He recently gave an interview on the current health of his creation. 
And in this interview, he despaired of the way in which the web allows hatred to grow and hatred to spread. I was caught by the news headline that reported on this interview, Web needs more love, says its creator. Berners-Lee lamented the fact that loving comments posted on a platform like Twitter, those comments will quickly fade away. But he said, if comments have a dose of hatred in them, they seem to gain momentum and people want to know what's being said. So often we feed on hatred rather than love, don't we? I'm sure he's right. And it's a sad commentary on our society, but at the same time, it is just a reflection of the realities of life in this world. It's a reflection of the sinful heart. And it resonates with our experience. It even resonates with our behavior. And because this is our regular experience in this very fallen and very broken world, we do find it hard to anticipate love, to trust love, to accept love. But Paul says to us, if we understand God's love, if we grasp it, if we comprehend it in increasing measure, well, that will lead to the end goal, end of verse 19, that we may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. I hope you long to be filled with the fullness of God today, to experience Him, to become like His Son, to be shaped and transformed by Him, to yield every corner of your life and your soul to Him. It's a good prayer. It's an appropriate longing. It's a right priority. But can it happen? Is it realistic? It all sounds wonderful, but there's a whole world of distraction and difficulty awaiting me when I walk out these doors, you say. There is a world of hatred awaiting me. There's a whole lot of turmoil in my heart. And if I'm honest, there's plenty of sinful resistance within me that's going to shipwreck any attempt to live in light of these truths that we've been thinking about this morning. It sounds good, Paul, but I feel defeated before I start. Well, the apostle knows all that. And that's why he finishes as he does. It's why he prays as he does in verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. If we're at all sensible, if we're at all realistic, we know the sinfulness of our hearts. We know the limitations of our flesh. And we'll say, these things are beyond me, Lord. And so Paul turns our eyes to the one who is able, able to do more, says Paul, able to do immeasurably more, able to do immeasurably more than we ask. And he adds one more, able to do immeasurably more than we ask or even imagine. And he's able to do it, not according to my power or your power, but according to his power, the power of his spirit that is already at work within us who believe. And so Paul commits us to him that he might do this work, that he might give us faith that Christ might dwell within, that he might give us understanding, that we might grasp this life-transforming love so that he might fill us with all the fullness of God. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth, a message called Knowing the Love of Christ from our series, The Unsearchable Riches of Christ. Well, this program is a listener-supported ministry. That's exactly what it sounds like. We depend on your generosity to keep Jonathan's teaching on this station. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to say thank you by sending you a book called Time Well Spent. It's a practical guide to developing your daily devotions. In this book, Colin Webster, the author, tackles the concerns that many of us may have about starting a devotional life. It's not a magic wand that sets you up to, to have a great devotional life, but it shows you what a devotional involves and how to set aside some of the common distractions and why our time with God is really so well spent. We'd love to send you a copy as you give a gift of any amount. You can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. Again, that's EncounterTheTruth.org or 833-99-TRUTH. Thanks for listening. 
and I hope you'll join us next time.